so I'm going to touch on um, a more focused area, um, given the sort of short time, and really um, particularly mention the restraints of the shoulder, um, talk about the labrum and instability, um, particularly unidirectional with anterior and posterior instability, and then multidirectional instability uh, as well. And the shoulder is such a, a complicated joint. It's got the greatest range of motion, really, of any joint in the body, and it's tremendously versatile, but that mobility comes really at the expense of stability. And its stability is dependent on this dynamic, um, static, and um, dynamic restraints of the joint. And any injury that disturbs that balance, be it to the, the, the muscles, be it to the, the labrum, be it to the bony glenoid, can lead to biomechanical changes and lead to instability, ultimately. Um, these can be quite poorly localized with pain and weakness, but popping, catching, grinding, or ultimately dislocations are all things that we see with uh, instability. And really, when we're thinking of the shoulder, um, the active restraints would be the, the cuff. The passive restraints are going to be the, the bony congruity, of which there isn't much in the shoulder, and then the labrocapsular complex, so really the, the labrum and the glenohumeral ligaments um, surrounding it. Um, the labrum itself, here we're looking um, really from posterior to anterior. This is the biceps labral complex coming in here at the superior aspect of the labrum. And the labrum is just like a, a little rolled up piece of plasticine that's around the, the glenoid. And it deepens the glenoid fossa um, and it helps form a pressure seal um, with the humeral head onto the glenoid. So it helps with the stability of the, of the joint. And it's the primary attachment of the, the biceps, long head of biceps, and the glenohumeral ligaments. Um, you know, personally, in, in our practice, we do MR arthrography for these, and we find that um, it's very well seen on MR arthrography, and the labrum should be a nice um, low signal triangle on, on all MR sequences. The glenohumeral ligaments, really, um, to me, the superior and the middle glenohumeral ligaments are just really there to confuse you, and it's really the, the anterior band of inferior glenohumeral ligament is the most important for, for stability. Um, and ultimately, these are just condensations or, or thickening of the, the joint capsule. But really, it's this anterior aspect of the um, middle gun or the inferior glenohumeral ligament that's the most important. Um, and we can see here, whenever the, the shoulder is um, in neutral, uh, this is quite uh, lax. And when you ever, whenever you externally rotate and abduct the shoulder, um, it forms this tight hammock um, that resists anterior dislocation of the humeral head. Whenever we think about instability, you can think of it all the way from this sort of unidirectional instability, which tends to be traumatic with a dislocation, all the way through to sort of atraumatic, someone that has a very lax joint just to, to start with. And what we're trying to do on MR is define any lesions that are the cause of the instability. Um, the traumatic is probably the one we see more of with uh, anterior shoulder dislocation, so I'm going to talk about it in a bit more depth. And so this is usually a traumatic anterior dislocation, and it's sort of 95 to 97 percent of all shoulder dislocations, and classically um, it's external rotation and, and abduction. And you know, if you look at this, it's classically the anteroinferior aspect of the glenoid and the superior aspect of the humeral head. So whenever you see someone that's dislocated, those are the areas that you should be focusing on. So for the hill sacs and packs and fracture superiorly, you can also get rotator cuff contusions at that site. And then you're looking at the anteroinferior aspect of the glenoid for your bony or fibrocartilaginous bank heart and for your labral tears. And really what the surgeon wants to know um, is not so much you know, the, you know, the alpses and the perthes and the gloms and the glads. It's mainly sort of, is there a labral tear? Um, what's the extent of this tear? Um, and is the labrum displaced? Um, is there any glenohumeral ligament tear? And is there a cuff abnormality or a bony defect? So um, really at its core, it's just is there a labral tear plus or minus and, and the extent of the tear. Um, whenever we look for glenohumeral ligament injuries, we look sort of at their attachment to the glenoid. We look at their attachment onto the humeral head. Um, and we can see sort of this area here. So this will be the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament coming from the anteroinferior aspect of the glenoid uh, and forming the auxiliary recess um, through there. And if we think of our classic sort of um, appearance here with the cartilage, the labrum, you know, the bony bank heart is the, you know, through this part of that link. So if we think you've know, got the bone, the cartilage, the glenohumeral ligament, you know, 
this whole chain, the labral ligamentous complex, can break at multiple levels. And in this particular part, it's broken through the, the bony glenoid. At this point, it's sort of sheared off a piece of cartilage. So this would be a glad or a glenoid labral articular disruption. You don't necessarily need to say that. You just need to say, you know, there's a, a labral tear with an associated cartilage defect. So describing these abnormalities is, is just as good as, as knowing the, the eponymous names. Um, and at this point here, we just have a, a fibrocartilaginous bank heart. So the, the labrum itself has torn. Um, and just to give you a bit of an overview of sort of what, what these look like on MR, this is our sort of classic representation, um, taking off like our little uh, triangles anteriorly and posteriorly. And the classic bank heart is just an avulsion of the labrum from the glenoid. Um, the periosteal attachment is torn as well. Um, and this is what we see in this instance here. Um, so nice detached anterior labrum separated from the glenoid with fluid tracking deep to it. One of the pitfalls for this is a Buford complex. So whenever you're up above the equator, when you're looking at the glenoid in that sort of anterosuperior quadrant, you can see a Buford complex. Um, and in that instance, you've got a thick cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament um, and an absent um, or somewhat small um, anterosuperior labrum. Another example here, and it's not just enough to say, you know, I can't see the anterior labrum or the anterior labrum is gone. It has to have gone somewhere. Um, and a good way to find it is to follow this anterior band of inferior glenohumeral ligament or the capsule. And as we come through, we can see this area here of increased soft tissue, and this is the displaced um, labrum that we're seeing in this sort of antero-inferior quadrant through there. So whenever we see these bank hearts, we want to give sort of a rough idea of where this tear is from and to. Um, does it extend posteriorly? Does it extend up through a slap tear? Does it extend into the biceps anchor? And this is really important for the orthopedic surgeon to plan what portals they're going to use to know how long the surgery is going to take. Perthes is, is again a labral tear, but in this, this time the periosteal attachment for the labrum uh, is still intact. Um, sometimes a neighbor view um, can help see these, um, but we can see them quite nicely on, on regular MR as well. And here we can see this nice um, periosteal sleeve that's attaching the labrum. But again, gadolinium is tracking deep to the labrum and into the base of that periosteal sleeve. Um, the alpsa in this particular instance can then displace. Um, so once you go sort of a perthes is like an undisplaced alpsa. Um, so in this instance here, you've got a periosteal sleeve that's still intact, but the labrum is displaced. Um, and what these can do is ultimately scar down um, onto the medial aspect of the humeral head here. Um, and it's important for the surgeon to know this as well because it's important that they then can go in and, and release that scarred down labrum. Another example here, um, we don't see a nice normal triangle here anteriorly in relation to the glenoid. Um, and we can follow again the, uh, the glenohumeral ligament through here and we see this sort of balled up area of displaced labrum just adjacent to the medial aspect of the neck of the glenoid. Um, so this presence of this ALPS is very important, as I mentioned, because the, the surgeon has to decide um, how they're going to do the, arth you know, the arthroscopy and what portals they're going to use. And it's going to take a long time to um, sort of unstick uh, that scar down bank heart until it comes up into its regular position. One of the other things that we're interested in is the glenohumeral ligaments. And you know, we normally should see a nice uh, U shape as it comes through here um, in the auxiliary recess. And here we have an avulsion. So this is a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. And it changes this auxiliary re recess from a U into a J shape. Uh, and we see this in sort of a, a younger population, uh, or sorry, an older population of uh, first-time dislocators. If you're a first-time dislocator less than the age of 30, you're more likely to tear your labrum. Another example here, we can see that we don't have this nice U shape. Um, there's irregularity here, some synovitis, and the attachment here of the, the anterior band of inferior glenohumeral ligament is not perfect onto the uh, neck of the proximal humerus. Uh, another example here uh, in the sagittal plane, you can see here this sort of balled up end of the pulled off um, haggle. 
You know, the, another thing that's very important whenever you're looking at um, this sort of uh, instability is to look for tears of the rotator cuff. Um, and we particularly see that of subscapularis associated with anterior shoulder dislocations. And here we can see a tear of the uh, subscapularis. And the bony lesions, this is almost the MR that should never be done. Um, this person is uh, dislocated and we can see the, the bony, uh, the hill sacs impaction fracture through here as it's impacted on the anteroinferior aspect of the glenoid. Um, hill sacs lesions, it's important um, because they can be large and engaging. Um, it's one of the things that imaging doesn't do very well is predict whether these are engaging or not. Um, not in our center, but in some centers, they'll do rotational osteotomies and do allografts to fill in these, uh, these defects. Uh, the bony bank heart as well, if you sort of think of the, the glenoid as being a golf tee uh, and the humeral head a golf ball, there's inherently not a lot of stability there to start with. And if you lose a significant aspect um, of the anterior aspect of your glenoid, then it's going to be unstable. Um, and if you lose sort of greater than 25% of the IAP dimension of the glenoid or the superior to inferior extent of this defect is more than the radius of the glenoid, then these are the sort of defects that require um, surgical repair. Uh, and again, here, a, a big, large um, bony bank heart. We would expect to see um, a bony glenoid in this sort of shape, and we've lost the, the majority of the anterior aspect. And this would be the sort of person that would dislocate their shoulder rolling out of bed. Posterior instability is, is less common. Um, it's usually a traumatic dislocation. As medical students, we learn all the ease of a posterior dislocation with epilepsy, electric shock, ECT. But it's really the traumatic posterior dislocation that's actually more common. And with these, it's the opposite way around. So we're looking for reverse hill sacs, and we're looking for tears of the posterior labrum. So just the opposite sets of, uh, of tears that we would see. It's one of the things that's often missed on plain films. So you have to look for lack of parallelism of the articular surfaces, um, incongruity of the articular surfaces as well. Um, two examples here um, of nice posterior shoulder dislocations that aren't that obvious on the, the frontal views. And the, the reverse hill sacs and Paxson fracture tends to be a lot more subtle with a posterior dislocation than with an anterior dislocation. Um, and you can often see it just adjacent to the um, articular surface here between the uh, lesser tuberosity and the articular surface. The posterior tear is very similar to anterior tears. Again, you're just looking for fluid extending um, at the base of the labrum. Um, and the same way we can get um, reverse haggles, reverse alpses, and reverse bank hearts, all associated with these posterior um, dislocations. This is a nice example here as well, um, where you look at the position of the humeral head with respect to the glenoid. It's posteriorly subluxed through here. Multidirectional instability, um, as the name suggests, is a dislocation or a, an instability in multiple planes. And this tends to be you know, people that are inherently lax or people that um, participate in overhead sports. So um, you know, tennis, um, you know, baseball pitchers, um, swimmers, those sorts of things can develop multidirectional instability. Um, you know, and it's thought that the repetitive stretching of this capsule in extreme range of motion leads to this instability. Um, they lose some joint proprioception as well, and they have an ultimate predisposition to joint dislocations. Um, in those instances, we look for a capacious joint capsule, look for joint subluxations, circumferential labral tears, um, maybe some hallmarks of a dislocation that's occurred as well. Um, and retroversion of the glenoid we can often see too. Now, whether that's due to um, posterior subluxation of the humeral head or whether that retroversion is causing the multidirectional instability, it's difficult to say. Another example here, we've got some um, posterior subluxation of the humeral head. Um, we've got this bony ossification um, posterior here, um, a Bennett uh, lesion, and the posterior labrum is displaced there um, with an extensive labral tear and a cartilage defect here um, anteriorly and the labral tear extending up through a slap. So circumferential labral tearing, posterior subluxation, um, all consistent with a multidirectional instability. <laughs>